Hello, this is Sean Holloway, the Administrative Assistant for Faculty Initiative at the American Association of Colleges of Nursing. Welcome to today's webinar. Please review the disclosures on your screen and I'll go over a few things before we get started. First, if you have a question, please type it into the chat box on your screen. Content-specific questions will be answered following the presentation or as time, or as time allows. The session will be recorded and will be available on the AACM website under on-demand webinars. At the end of the session, you will be given access to a program evaluation. It will also be sent to you in a follow-up email. It is now my pleasure to kick off today's webinar, BCNE Accreditation Standard 4, Program Effectiveness, Assessment and Achievement of Program Out Outcome. At this time, I'll pass the presentation over to the Director of Accreditation Services, Lori Schrader. Lori? Thank you, Sean. Um, well, I am once again excited to be here to facilitate this um, fourth and final webinar related to the newly revised CCNE accreditation standards. And I'm pleased to be able to, um, sorry, I'm pleased to be able to share with you um, a little bit of information about our presenters today and to introduce them to you. Um, I'm going to go ahead and do this in alphabetical order, um, so I'm, I'm not playing favorites or one is not more important than the other, but first I'd like to introduce Dr. Deborah Davis and to just share a little bit with you about um, her role and her, her knowledge and experience with CCNE. Uh, Dr. Davis served as the co-chair on the current standards committee. She is also a past board member, having served two full terms, including as vice chair. And she's also a past co-chair of the report review committee. Dr. Mary Jane Hansen is a current member of the CCNE board and is serving as the vice chair. She's the co-chair of the substantive change review committee. She's a past member of the report review committee and she also served on this most recent standards committee. So we are well served today with lots and lots of CCNE knowledge and experience to talk about standards for as we move forward. So what do we hope to have happen by the end of this webinar? Well, we hope that you're going to have developed an understanding of standard four in the newly revised standards, that you're gonna learn about CCNE's expectations and ways to present evidence to demonstrate compliance with Standard 4, and also to gain some information about when the CCNE standards go into effect and what resources are available to you um, during this transition period. As many of you know, um, CCNE is celebrating its 20th anniversary this year, and we just wanted to take a moment to thank you for your support. You can see that CCNE currently accredits um, close to 1,800 nursing programs at 830 institutions. You can see the breakdown, and we just want to thank you for your continued support over these past 20 years. So what do you need to know about the newly revised standards in terms of what to expect when you open that, that hard copy that will be made available um, later this fall, probably in September? Well, the first thing you need to know is that there's no change in the organization of the standards. There's still four standards. Each of those standards has key elements with elaboration statements beneath it. And at the end of each standard is a list of supporting documentation. And that documentation that is listed at the end of each of the standards um, does provide information regarding what a program needs to provide either on site um, in their resource room or what they might want to provide as an appendix in their self-study document. What you might notice when you go through the new standards is that the number of standards has remained the same at four, but the number of key elements has gone up just a tiny bit um, and it's not so much that there are new requirements, but rather where we had lengthy key elements previously, we've broken those apart to try to simplify those for you. So this is the burning question that I know everyone out there is wanting the answer to. So here it is. The 2018 standards for accreditation go into effect for all programs on January 1st, 2019. 
So what that means is any program that's hosting an on-site evaluation or submitting a report to CCNE on or after January 1st, 2019 must address the 2018 standard. So what can you look for right now? What do we have available for you? Well, in addition to the pre-publication version of the standards, which is available on the CCNE website, we also have a crosswalk table that we've um, published for your um, use that compares the CCNE 2013 standards to the new revised 2018 standards. We've done the same for the criteria for evaluation of nurse practitioner programs. Um, which are required for programs that um, prepare nurse practitioners. So we've done a crosswalk of the NTS criteria document to the newly revised CCNE standards. Additionally, you will find if you are a program that's preparing your self-study document for 2019, you'll find that the self-study template is already available to you on the CCNE website. And if you are a chief nurse administrator, or a CCNE evaluator, these materials are also available in the CCNE online community. We also already have available to you the NTS criteria worksheet. And again, this applies only to graduate programs that are preparing nurse practitioners. And coming soon um, will be a new CIPR template and substan substantive change notification template um, for reports that will be being submitted on or after January 1st. Okay, so two things I really want you to think about as we're moving through the um, webinar today, just to keep um, at the forefront. And the first is that it's really important that you read the standard, each key element, and its elaboration statement in its entirety. Um, I can tell you after 18 months of staffing the standards committee that um, every word in the, the standards, the key element, and elaboration statements are purposeful and they're important. So you're going to want to make sure that you read thoroughly those key elements and the elaboration statements and be sure that when you are um, submitting a report, whether that's a self-study document or a CIPR, the Continuous Improvement Progress Report, um, or any other type of follow-up report, that you're really addressing the key element in its entirety. So now, um, Dr. Davis, Deborah, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you. Let me get myself unmuted here. This is just, uh, the next few slides is going to show you a summary of changes that have been made. And uh, in key element 4A, the really the change has just been sort of editorial. It defines program as baccalaureate, master's, DMP, or postgraduate certificate. So that uh, that is a clear key element 4B. We, um, that has been reorganized so that uh, the, it's clear that there are a number of uh, options that can be used to demonstrate compliance. And more specifically, it states how that uh, completion rate should be reported. Key element 4C adds, has become a split into two key elements. 4C will address licensure pass rates, and 4D will, will um, work with uh, certification pass rates. So if a school has, for example, uh, a pre-licensure baccalaureate program, but doesn't have a program that prepares students for certification exams, then 4C would be applicable to that school, but 4D would not be applicable because the school is not preparing graduates for a certification exam. And the next slide. I've lost my, okay. So for 4C and D, again, it's reorganized so that you have more clearly delineated options to show compliance, and it provides further guidance for counting repeat takers. So that is with, um, with, with repeat takers for your licensure or certification exam. For D, 
for D addresses um, provide it provides options for schools to combine pass rate data for multiple exams. So, for example, if a school is preparing students to take the F uh, AFMP exam, as you know, there's more than one out there, and the school when they get that data back on pass rate on the on the different certification exams that students take, that that can be combined to come up with one pass rate so that um, that clarifies that option. The old 4D is now 4E, and this has been clarified to um, demonstrate that what we're really looking for is that employment data is collected within 12 months of program completion. We're not, not looking at the time of admission, and uh, we'll get into that a little bit more later. Uh, 4-H is now 4-F, and it speaks to how completion, licensure, certification, and employment data are used for program improvement. So in these previous key elements, uh, schools have told us how they're doing relative to meeting the expected standard, and then in the new 4-F, they talk about, well, how they're using that information that they have collected to help improve their program. And then we will move to the next slide. For F is now for G. And the old 4F talked about individual faculty outcomes. And this has been restructured so that individual is gone because the real focus of this, of this key element is to look at aggregate faculty outcome. How as a group are your faculty doing in terms of um, achieving the outcomes that you've set for them. 4-H speaks to now, you've told us in 4-G what your aggregate faculty outcomes are. Now in 4-H, schools will have an opportunity to say how they're using that data from improvement. 4-E is now 4-I. And it defines um, a little bit of better definition of what we mean by other program outcomes. And it compares requirements. And it clarifies that expected outcomes are to be compared to the actual outcomes. For J, used to be for H. And this is an opportunity for schools to take the information that was presented in uh, uh, for I and describe how they're using that data, how their expected outcomes when compared to um, actual outcomes, how they're actually using that data to foster program improvement. And then, Mary Jane, is this one yours or? Starts on page five. I don't have my page numbers here. You can go ahead, Deborah. Okay. So, with the exception of key elements um, 4A, 4B, and 4C, you will see that um, all of the key elements have been renumbered. And additional items for supporting documentation has been added. We tried to clarify the language. And then language has been added that specifically states that the information listed is expected to be included in the self-study document or on site. Thank you, Deborah. Um, I, I appreciate um, that summary, as I'm sure the rest of our webinar for, um, participants do. Um, before we really do a deep dive into Standard 4, I think it's important that we go ahead and get everyone um, thinking about Standard 4, thinking about the language that we use in Standard 4. So we're just going to quickly present some information that we hope gets people in the mood to talk about uh, assessment and program outcomes and um, all that really good stuff that people get excited about. So the first thing here is just in the glossary for the CCNE standards, program outcomes are defined as results that participants, individually or in the aggregate, derive from their association with the nursing program. The results are measurable and observable and may be quantitative or qualitative, broad or detailed. 
I don't think there's anything else we need to add to that right now, but I hope that everyone who's listening is really letting that sink in because we use the, the term program outcomes um, extensively throughout the standards, so it's really important to have a good grounding and understanding as to what is, is meant by program outcomes. So outcomes can be, um, outcomes are indicators of achievement and they need to be specific, they need to be measurable, and they need to be observable. So here we've just provided um, two different examples of, of outcomes. The first is one that's specific and measurable. So you can see here that there's a lot of specificity. Alumni from the baccalaureate degree program in nursing will express satisfaction with overall program effectiveness and in meeting expected student learning outcomes at 80% or higher on the alumni survey. The example of an outcome that is not specific or measurable is something more like this, something more esoteric, such as upon graduation, students will be better citizens of the world. So, um, Deborah or Mary Jane, do you have any food for thought or um, recommendations that you would like to make to those folks who are participating in this webinar in terms of some tips for writing um, outcome statements that are specific and measurable? Well, I think it's, it's similar to when you're doing an evaluation plan for your program or, or anything um, and you're writing um, expected outcomes. Uh, they, they always have to be specific, measurable, and observable so that uh, you can actually identify whether you're meeting your outcomes or not. And um, I think we are going to get into this a little bit more later. I don't have anything else. Mary Jane? Yeah, I was just going to reiterate what you said, Deborah. I think of working with students a lot when I sometimes work with graduate students to talk with them about let's develop some uh, some objectives for your clinical site, objectives or outcomes. And, and when they say things like, I will be better at um, uh, at, at auscultating uh, 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 sounds. I will be better at um, um, assessing tympanic membranes. So better is difficult to ascertain difficult to measure, you know, tell me how you will be better. I will be able to identify the specific landmarks in the ear. So making it specific and measurable, um, again, like Lori said before, not, not in general esoteric terms. Thank you both. I think that those, those tips are, are really helpful. So the next thing that we want you to keep in mind is the difference between expected levels of achievement and actual levels of achievement. So when you've identified your outcome, as part of that outcome, you've indicated what you expect. So you expect, you know, an 80% rate of satisfaction. You expect 70% of students to um, do X or, you know, whatever it might be. So that's your expected level of achievement and that's stated within your outcome. But then there's what actually happens. So we all like to dream big, right? And so um, sometimes we are able to exceed our expected level of achievement. So perhaps we've set an expectation at 70% or 80%, but the actual level of achievement is higher than that. Perhaps it's 90 or 100%, or sometimes it is less than what we hoped for. So you might have an actual level of achievement that it is 50%, for instance, as opposed to that 80%. But so when you're looking at your data and when you're talking about your data, you want to talk about um, the expected level of achievement, and that's what's stated in your outcome. And then the actual level of achievement is where you talk about what actually happened. Um, you might just want to make note that in key elements 4B, 4C, 4D and 4E, that CCNE has set the expected level of achievement um, as required by the U.S. Department of Education, and we've outlined what these expectations are in the elaboration statement. Um, in case you were wondering, 4B is completion, 4C is licensure pass rates, 4D is 
certification pass rates, and 4E is um, employment rate. So, Deborah and Mary Jane, would it be accurate to state that um, a program is welcome to set higher levels of achievement um, than are noted by CCNE in key elements 4B, 4C, 4D, and 4E? But the CCNE's expectation is that minimally they meet those um, expectations as published in the standards. Exactly, uh, Lori. I think um, what I always like to uh, keep in mind is that I think it's important for programs to set meaningful uh, expected levels of achievement, whether it be rates that differ or a little bit higher than the CCNE expectations for completion, licensure, and certification. Um, it perhaps it means something to the program, they would like to achieve higher standards. But I would also remind the programs then when, when we're setting expected levels of achievement, do make them meaningful, but don't make them unrealistic. Um, I think we'd all like 100% on certification and licensure pass rates uh, and, and employment and completion. But unfortunately, in today's world, it's not, or whatever, whatever other outcome that we would, we would define. Maybe we would like 100% of the faculty to have a scholarly publication every year, but is that realistic? So I would ask programs to, to really um, have discussions about what, what are meaningful expected levels of achievement, uh, make them meaningful, but, but don't, and give ourselves somewhat of a bar, of course, but don't make them unrealistic. That's good advice, Mary Jane. Thank you. Yeah, a lot of the examples we gave were percentages. You know, 50% will do this, 100% will do that. But you don't have to have a percentage. CCNE doesn't say that you have to necessarily have a quantitative um, uh, uh, ex expected level of achievement. So you could have qualitative um, expected levels of achievement too. So I'll just give you some, just a couple of examples uh, a school might have as a program outcome that they want to achieve regional recognition for something, or they want to be ranked nationally at a certain level. Or um, I think probably what you see in, um, in, in a lot of colleges that are trying to increase the quality of their freshman class, you may, they may have a program outcome or an outcome um, looking at, um, looking at, at scores on, on the, that show that they've increased the quality of their student body some way. So just trying to point out that you don't necessarily have to have 50% or 100% or whatever. You could have some qualitative measures too, but the, the, the idea is, is whatever you use, that it needs to be something that you can um, measure so that you can determine whether you've met your goal, your expectation, your program outcome or not, if that makes sense. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Deborah and Mary Jane. So, Again, as we're moving along in standard four, um, just something to keep in mind, we often get this question, um, what does CCNE mean by completion or completer? Um, many of you, I'm sure, are aware that when the current 2013 standards went into effect, that CCNE for the first time began accrediting postgraduate APRN certificate programs. And so, for the purpose of the standards in the 2013 as well as the 2018, which we're addressing today, um, CCNE has chosen to use the word completion or completer because students graduate from a nursing degree program or they've completed a postgraduate APRN certificate program, but it is also correct to indicate that someone who has graduated is also a completer or has completed the program. So um, just wanting to clarify any con confusion that there might be related to that particular uh, terminology. And finally, before we take a deep dive into the standards, just want to talk about the use of not applicable or not applicable. It's a tomato-tomato kind of thing. I don't know how you like to say it. I say it both ways. Um, it's only used in standard four 
when one, there have been no completers or graduates of the overall degree or certificate program. And this applies to key elements 4B, 4C, 4D, 4E, and 4F. Um, so let me give you an example. So for instance, you offer a baccalaureate degree program. And as part of that baccalaureate degree program, you have three tracks. Perhaps you have a traditional pre-licensure track, you have a post-licensure RN to BSN track, and you also have a track for uh, second degree students, students who already have a baccalaureate degree in another area. And perhaps you only have um, completers in one of those tracks. Perhaps you've only had students complete um, in the pre-licensure traditional track. Because the data is being provided for the overall degree program, that key element related to completion, 4B, would be applicable. So it's not related to the different tracks offered within the degree program or the overall certificate program, um, the tracks in the certificate program. Sorry about that. It's related to the overall degree or certificate program. So if you have completers or graduates in any one track that's part of your overall degree program or your overall certificate program, that key element is going to be applicable um, to your institution. In terms of the second bullet, the program does not prepare individuals to take licensure or certification exams. Well, first you have to have students that would um, be eligible to take those exams. So you would have to have individuals who've actually completed. Um, but you would also have to have students that have taken the exam, and those exams need to be specifically stated by the institution that you prepare students for those exams. Um, I know that those sentences I just used were a little awkward, so I'm going to do a little better here. Um, let me give you an example. Let's say you have a master's degree program and it has a nurse educator track. If your program advertises to students that they prepare individuals to take the nurse educator exam, then the program would be responsible for collecting and reporting the data related to students who have passed or not passed the nurse educator exam. If you haven't had any students take the exam, then there would not be any data to report, even if you are preparing those students to take the exam. Conversely, if the program indicates that they do not prepare students to take the nurse educator exam, they don't advertise it, they don't tell students that they're going to be prepared to take the exam, then the program um, would consider this key element to be not applicable because they don't prepare students for that particular exam. So um, hopefully I have not confused things more. Um, Deborah and Mary Jane, anything you would like to add or uh, clarify uh, for us before I turn it completely over to Mary Jane? I don't have anything I understand. I uh, am not being heard real well. I apologize. I will try and speak up a little bit and, and please give us feedback if you're still having difficulty hearing me. I apologize. Terrific. Okay, I'm turning it over to you, Mary Jane. All righty. So let's start with standard four, the last of the four standards um, we have. Standard four looks at program effectiveness. It says the program is effective in fulfilling its mission and goals as evidenced by achieving expected outcomes. Program outcomes include student learning outcomes or student outcomes, faculty outcomes, and other outcomes identified by the program. And data on program effectiveness are used to foster ongoing improvement. So here we, in this standard, we expect that measurable outcomes are identified. There's our word again, measurable outcomes are identified with expected levels of achievement for each of those outcomes. And then that actual outcome data are gathered by the program and compared with what is expected. 
And then even more importantly, we're hope what we want to do is to have the programs close the loop is the terminology we hear a lot, is share how it is that you're able to use this outcome data to improve your program. The first key element for A states that there is a systematic process in place that describes how program effectiveness is assessed or evaluated, kind of use those terms a little interchangeably. So how you're assessing, evaluating, measuring program effectiveness. The systematic process is used to do that. Note in the elaboration, please, that all programs under consideration must be addressed uh, by using this, or must be included or discussed with regard to using the systematic process. So if you're having a baccalaureate and a master's program that's being evaluated or is under consideration for accreditation, we would obviously want to see information in that systematic process that tells us what the baccalaureate and master's programs are doing to assess program effectiveness. In some areas, of course, there may be a little bit of overlap, but we should certainly would not want to see one of those programs eliminated. We would, it would certainly be important that um, all of the programs that are under consideration uh, are included in the process. There's very important bullet points up here on, on this key element, and as Lori mentioned before, it's very important that when you're writing to this or any other key element, please be sure that each of the bullet points is addressed. It's easy to read the heading and think, yes, I've done that and go on, and then one of the bullet points is missed, and it's important that all the bullet points are addressed. Uh, for, there be, for there to be compliance with the key elements. So the first bullet point tells us that this process must be written, ongoing, and it has to address what constitutes achievement of program outcomes. The second bullet point says that the systematic process or plan, to use either term, must be comprehensive. It has to address completion, licensure, certification, employment rate, obviously, the, uh, if applicable for the completion, licensure, certification, employment, depending if you uh, had folks to fit, uh, fit in those categories, and we'll be talking a little bit more about each of those categories. But nonetheless, even if you wouldn't have any data to report, um, if it's a new program, there should be evidence in the evaluation plan that you have a process for how uh, these data will be gathered and reported. Additionally, faculty outcome data must be gathered and reported as well as other program identified outcomes. The next bullet point uh, talks to the fact that, and Deborah mentioned this a little bit earlier, the, we can use either qualitative or quantitative data. Um, with regard to how we're measuring our program effectiveness or our program outcomes. So identify what data you're using. Maybe there's a certain tool or survey that you're using. Um, maybe it's a self-developed tool or survey. So that would be in this plan. You would be telling us what you are using uh, to collect the data, what type of data you are collecting and what you're using to collect it. Um, the next bullet point talks about timelines. The process should include timelines. What is the frequency of data collection? And not only how often are the data collected, but tell us about the frequency of analysis as well. And finally then, um, there should be a time frame. It should be evident that this systematic process is reviewed with some, with, with some sort of frequency. Um, that you look at the process and you make changes or revisions in your systematic process um, as appropriate. As I said, please be sure all the bullet points are addressed when you uh, develop your systematic process or in your written systematic process.
Deborah. A minute. Um, for we're going to go move on to key element four B. Key element. Can we move the slide to slide twenty two, please? Um, All right. There we are. Might be on a delay, Deborah. It, 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 it's there. Okay. All right. So this key element uh, uh, addresses completion rates. And remember, we've already said this several times, but um, if you don't have anyone who has completed your program, then this key element is not applicable to you. But for those, stu those uh, programs that do have at least one uh, person who has completed their program, then it is applicable. And there are three ways that there are three ways that a program can demonstrate compliance. And compliance is defined as 70% or higher for completion rate by CCNE. So one of three ways, if um, a school would look at the completion rate for the most recent calendar year, and I want to um, just point out to you that that is calendar year, January 1 through December 31st. It's not an academic year. So you have to collect your data and analyze it for a calendar year. But if you look at the most recent calendar year and you have 70% or higher, then you have, you, you're done. You have met the expectation and you don't have to do any of the, either of the other two um, ways that you can calculate. But if you find, if the school finds that they are less than 70%, then they can look back over the past three years and look at, the, look at the numbers of students who have completed during the past three years. And if that calculation is 70% or higher, then again, they're done. If not, the, a school could go on to a third way to determine that they are in compliance. And CCNE recognizes that a lot of times students drop out of a program or don't complete a program, and it really doesn't have anything to do with the quality of the program. It has to do with uh, factors, uh, extenuating factors that all students go through, that life happens, if you will. So some students will drop out of a program because of family obligations, or they, it, they will move to a different area of the country, and so they can't attend the school anymore. They'll run into money issues and not be able to come up with the money to pay their uh, tuition and fees. Or uh, they decide that uh, they want to change their major, or, or they decided that they want to go to a different institution. So a school can eliminate those people from their complete completion rate formula if, if, those, um, if that kind of thing is, has adversely affected you're reaching the 70%. So once you exclude those people, if you have a 70%, then you're in compliance. And the next paragraph under the elaboration provides additional information on what you need to do to calculate a completion rate. So the first thing is, is that a school or a program has to define the cohort. The school program has to define, well, what is the entry point for that cohort, and how much time does this cohort have to complete the program? And Lori gave you an example earlier of a school that had a pre-licensure baccalaureate program and an RN to BSN program, for example. So you may, you may have different tracks within a program, and a school may be interested in how long it takes um, a, a pre-licensure student to complete versus an RN to BSN. But what CC&E wants is what is your overall program completion rate? So you don't, you don't report out by tracks, you combine everybody together to report out your, um, your completion rate. The, you're also will need, when you're addressing 4B, to provide the formula that you're using. And if you get down to using the third bullet point where, where you have eliminated students from your calculation, then you need to um, describe what reasons your particular program is looking at to exclude students 
and how many students fell into those to those categories. So we will move on to uh, 4B, which is a recap. So again, completion rates, those who've completed the uh, a postgraduate APRN certificate or those who have graduated from a nursing degree program that's under review. So if you have students who have completed coursework but they haven't yet been awarded a certificate or graduated from the program, then those students would not be included in your formula for your completion rate. And then we will go on to 24, page 24. So keep in mind, program completion rates are provided for the overall degree program under review, not all of the tracks. Completion rates are calculated for a calendar year, not an academic year. And schools are required to give us the formula that they're using to calculate those completion rates. And if students are excluded from the calculation, then, if, then schools are expected to explain why the students were ex excluded and um, how many of those students in those categories were excluded. So in our next slide, we have some examples of what a student could say in their self-study report um, that would demonstrate uh, that the school is in compliance with 4B with, with uh, regards to their completion rates. So the first example is the school calculated their completion rate and um, it's 70% or higher for the most recent calendar year and they did find that they have some tracks and maybe these tracks aren't all 70% but when they put everybody together they they are uh, 70 percent. So as long as the program provides documentation that the completion rate for the program meets 70 percent, they're going to be they're going to be okay. And like I have already explained, if they're not in the recent calendar year 70 percent, then they can look at over the last they can look at grad, people who graduated or completed over the last three calendar years to see if they reach that 70 percent level or they can look back and say, well, the reason we're not at 70% is because we had a couple of students who dropped out due to family reasons. We had a couple of students who changed majors. We had another student who uh, couldn't get the money to come. And if we eliminate those people from our calculation, then we are at our 70% ratio, our, our goal. So Mary Jane, I will turn it over to you. Okay, Deb, good job, thank you. So we're going on to key element 4C, and this has to do with licensure class rates that demonstrate program effectiveness. So like we talked about with 4B, this key element is not applicable to a program that does not prepare individuals for licensure examinations or does not yet have individuals who have taken the licensure examinations. The program may be um, a, a, a graduate level program that doesn't do entry level preparation, could be an RN to BSN program. So for any of those programs, this key element would not apply. Or this new program that has not yet had individuals that have taken the licensure examination. We've got some options here for how the expected level of achievement, which is 80%, can be met. But before I talk about those options, let me just clarify for this key element, pass rate data must be provided separately for each campus site and track. In Deborah's slide where she talked about completion rates, we were looking at overall program completion rates. For key element 4C, task rate data must be provided separately for each campus site and track. Different campus sites or tracks within a baccalaureate program cannot be combined when recording licensure pass rate data. Let me just give you an example or two, if I may. 
say a university has two campuses for its BSN program, maybe one in Duluth and one in Littleton. Um, the pass rate data must be provided separately for each of those campuses. We'd have pass rate data for Duluth and we'd have pass rate data for Littleton. Additionally, a university might have multiple tracks. Uh, they might have a traditional four-year BSN track. Uh, they might have an accelerated two-year track. They might have a master's entry track. The pass rate data must be provided separately for each of those tracks. I can take this one step farther if you'll bear with me. If a university has two campuses and two tracks at each campus, they've got one in Littleton and one in Duluth, and at Littleton and Duluth they, eat, they have a traditional and they have an accelerated track. So we're talking about two campuses with two tracks each, so you're going to get those will be four sets of data. The data for each track at each campus must be provided separately. So that's an important differentiation I wanted to make here. That said then, there are four options that can be used to demonstrate compliance with this key element. And those options are listed as bullet points in the key element. The first says that if the 80%, if the pass rate for first time takers is 80% or higher for the most recent calendar year, January 1 for December 31, again, keep in mind we're looking at data separately for each campus site and track if more than one of those exists. But if the first time pass rate is 80% or higher, for the most recent calendar year, like Deborah said when she was talking about her slide, you've, you've met. There's been compliance, so your program needs to go no farther. If that option is not met, we have some other options that the school can choose. If the pass rate for that campus site or track is 80% or higher for all takers, that would be individuals who took the exam first time and any repeaters who passed the exam. So we'll add the first time people that passed as well as any repeaters who passed. If that percentage reaches 80% for the most recent calendar year, there is compliance with this key element for that specific site and, and or track. Now, there are two other options that can be used. And for options three and four, we're looking at a three-year period. And we're looking at everyone who took the exam over the past three years. For the third option listed there, the third bullet point, if the pass rate for the campus site or track is 80% or higher for all individuals who took the exam over the most recent three years, then there is compliance with the key element. Another way, the fourth bullet point addresses if the pass rate for each campus site and track is 80% or higher for all takers, that would be everyone that passed the first time, including adding everyone who passed on a repeat attempt. If that percentage is 80% or higher over the three most recent calendar years, there is compliance with this key element. So the schools have four options. You have, you have uh, the programs, I should say. Programs have four options to demonstrate compliance with this key element. Another important point I want to make just before we switch slides is that different options can be used for different campuses or tracks. We were in Duluth and Littleton a little bit ago. Maybe at Duluth, the first time pass rate for the generic program, everyone that took that graduated from Duluth, they might have had an 86% first time pass rate. Great. But maybe at the Littleton campus, the first time pass rate was only 74%. However, if we looked at all takers, if we looked at those individuals who also repeated and passed, 
maybe we had a rate of 88%. So it is possible to choose different options. There's no one option that's better than another. We had to put them in some sort of order, but by meeting any one of those options for any campus site or track would mean that there is compliance with key element 4C. So keep in mind, and again, I'm repeating a little bit and summarizing here, the, camp, the NCLEX pass rate for each campus site and track must be 80% or higher. The licensure pass rates are calculated and provided based on calendar year, which is January 1 through December 31. And you can choose which option you want. Um, you don't need to call and say, as I said, which option is better? All options are fine. Either one of those, you may need it by all four options or three options. You just need to please describe, describe the option you're using and tell us what the percentage is. The way the program calculates the pass rate for each campus site and track can differ, and I tried to make that point earlier because I think it's important. As long as the option used is one of the CCNE options on the previous slide. And please remember, each campus site and track is expected to meet the 80% level of achievement. CCNE does not accredit different sites or different tracks within a baccalaureate program. We accredit the program. Or if it would be a master's entry, but we accredit the program. So you can, it's expected then for compliance for this key element, if there are multiple sites, multiple tracks, then each campus site and track would be expected to meet the 80% level of achievement. Thank you, Mary Jane. That was really helpful. Before we move on, I just, I want, I want to have a, a brief conversation about how programs might collect data um, related to pass rates, whether that's licensure pass rates, and I don't want to jump ahead to certification and, and rain on, on anyone's parade, but, um, you know, we frequently get questions that a state board of nursing doesn't provide data by calendar year or a state board of nursing or a certifying body um, don't provide data by a campus or site or maybe by track. Um, as I, could you speak to um, different ways that programs can um, get pass rate data in addition to from, let's say, state boards of nursing and certifying bodies? Um, sure. The programs can do self-report, or we can ask the students for self-report. We can contact the students and ask them. Um, that's another way we, we could get those data. Terrific. Thank you. Terrific. Um, cool. Uh, one other one other way one other way that uh, my school used is uh, if you know you've got people that are in a and they're living in a certain state uh, and I have somebody that's assigned that would contact students to but sometimes uh, it's easier to go on the state board of nursing website and put in that person's name to see if they're licensed in the state so you use a variety of ways to try to collect the data if you are in a state that really doesn't give that uh, information back to the schools. That was a helpful tip, Deborah. Thank you. Okay, so we'll move on to 4D, and I'm going to continue here because it was a little bit related to uh, 4C. We're talking about pass rates. So this key element addresses certification pass rate. And, and as Lori had mentioned before, we've, we've, and, and Deborah, when she talked about changes uh, between the previous version, the 2013 version of the standards and this version, what we've done here is licensure pass rates is 4D, and we put, or I'm sorry, 4C, and we put the certification pass rate 
in 4D. So 4D states certification pass rates demonstrate program effectiveness. And just like I mentioned earlier, this key element is not applicable to a degree or certificate program that does not prepare individuals for certification exams or does not yet have, have individuals who have taken certification exams. And I, I think Lori talked about this a little bit. So if the uh, program professes that in its publications or it's an APRN role and they state we prepare you to take certification exam X or Y, then we would want to see these data. If the program does not specifically prepare individuals to take an exam, um, maybe they're eligible down the road, but they don't pre necessarily profess that the students are prepared to take this exam, then the data would not be, need to be reported. So um, the master's DNP and postgraduate certificate programs demonstrate achievement of required program outcomes regarding certification for programs that prepare students for certification. Pass rates are obtained and reported for those completers taking each exam, even when national certification is not required to practice in a particular state. I'm repeating here a little bit. I think it's important for programs that prepare students for certification the data are provided regarding the number of completers taking each certification exam and the number that pass. A program is required to provide these data regardless of the number of test takers. A program that prepares students for certification demonstrates that it meets the pass rate of 80% for each exam in any one of the following ways. Again, we have options. Let me reiterate for um, programs that specifically prepare students for certification, pass rate data must be provided. Mary Jane, before we jump into the options, you know, a question that we get fairly frequently is, is CCNE only interested in certification pass rates for um, APRN programs? No, the, the program could perhaps they specifically prepare students to take a nurse administrator exam if they if they note in their catalog or their publications that if you complete this specific specialization, you will be prepared to take um, a, 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 a specific uh, administration exam or we're specifically preparing you to take an education exam. If the program states that they are preparing graduates for a specific exam, even if that exam is not required to practice, then we would ask, yes, to please see those data. Thank you, Mary Jane. Thank you. So um, there are four options, again, as there were before. And just like I said with the last slide, either of the four options can be used. And again, we ask the program to tell us which option they're using um, for each of the certification pass rates that are being reported. You're going to see some similarities here in these four options. Again, the first two options um, talk about the most recent calendar year, January 1 through December 31. And here, the pass rate for the certification exam is the first time pass rate is 80% or higher for the most recent calendar year. So if that is the result, then the program is finished. They've had compliance uh, with, with, with that key element for that specific exam. Another option, again, similar to what we saw in 4C in with licensure rates, we can look at not only first-time takers, but we can look at all-time takers. So if first-time takers and any repeaters who pass, if we add those numbers together and we get 80% or higher for the most recent calendar year, then there is compliance. 
like we saw before, we also have the third and fourth option, the third and fourth bullet point. And with the third and fourth bullet point, we're looking at everyone who took the exam over the past three years. So with the third bullet point, if the first time pass rate is 80% or higher over the most recent three calendar years, then there is compliance. The last bullet tells us that if the pass rate is 80% or higher for all takers, that's individuals that passed the first time, as well as anyone who repeated the exam and passed. If that rate is 80% or higher over the three most recent calendar years, then there is compliance. Just like I stated before, a program may be preparing students for different types of exams. Maybe they're preparing students for a psych mental health exam and an FNP exam. Different options of the four options that I listed, different options can be used for different examinations, but please identify the option that you used. I'd like to make two points additionally before we move to the next slide. What you're going to, what you see here is pass rate data for certification exams need to be provided by examination for each degree or certificate program. The data do not need to be reported separately by campus site and by campus and site. So back to our Duluth and Littleton schools, if they have an FNP program at Duluth and an FNP program at Littleton, those data can be can be combined for the FNP program. We do not ask for pass rate data separated by campus site. Now, clearly the pass rate data are gonna be separated by track because you'll be preparing people for different exams. But we do not ask for pass rate data to be separated by campus site. And if we look at the last paragraph, the other point I'd like to make before we move on is says that the program identifies which of the above options was used, and it also provides pass rate data for each exam. But when calculating the pass rate described above, you may combine certification pass rate data for multiple examinations related to the same role and population. For example, when there are multiple exams related to the same role and population, and Deborah talked about this earlier, the family nurse practitioner exam and the adult nurse practitioner exam are two examples. There are different um, certification agencies that give those examinations. It's the same role and population, family NP, so pass rate data may be combined. You might have a program where half of the students take an exam from one certifier and the other half take the exam from the other certifier. You may combine those data. If there are multiple exams that relate to the same role and population focus, you may combine the data. Obviously, you're not combining data for a psych exam and a family NP exam, but if it's the same role and population focus, you may combine the data. Mary Jane, remember, remember, sure. I'm sorry, Lori, go ahead. No, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I thought you had completed your thought. Why don't you go ahead and then I'll jump in. Okay, I was just going to add one more point um, that although we're talking about data do not have to be separated by campus site, but please remember that the data must be separated by program. Master's, post-master's certificate, and DNT would all be reported separately. We accredit programs, so the data must be separated by program. You might have a master's FNP track and a post-master's FNP track. So those data need to be provided separately by program. Data cannot be combined for a master's and a post a, a master's degree program and a post-master's certificate program. 
Thank you, Mary that Jane. Was that, was that, that was actually what I was going to jump in about. So I'm just going to feed that back to you because it's such an important point and it's one that we know there's a lot of confusion about. So the CCNE Board of Commissioners take separate accreditation actions on degree programs and the postgraduate APRN certificate program. So the program needs to separately address um, the postgraduate APRN certificate program from the degree program. Um, we're aware that, for instance, many institutions' um, postgraduate APRN certificate programs align with their master's and or DMP programs, and they may think of these students um, kind of from the same pot, if you will, but, but for CCNE purposes, we, they are different groups, the different programs are receiving separate accreditation, so the master's degree program is getting accredited and being reviewed for accreditation, as is the postgraduate APR and certificate program. So um, I'm just repeating what you said, but those data do need to be reported separately. So thank you. I think we've hit that home and out of the park now, right? <laughs> Sounds good. I think so too. Well, well, and another another way to say it, Laurie, is even if the students are sitting in the same classroom for their NP education, if you will, you still you have to track the the students separately if, if you're using those courses as part of a, the example that you gave, a master's curriculum and the postgraduate certificate curriculum. Great. Okay, uh, one more slide here and then we'll give it back to uh, Deborah, I guess. So th this is, these are just some summary points. Please keep in mind that the pass rate data must be provided for each exam for which the program states it prepares graduates. And Lori had asked me a question about that and we talked about that earlier. Regardless of whether the exam is required to, pro to practice, if the program states it's preparing students to take a specific exam, then we would like to see those pass rate data, please. Certification pass rates are calculated and provided again on a calendar year, and I don't know that I hit home on that earlier. If I didn't, I apologize. So again, we're looking at calendar year data here, just like we did for licensure pass rate. The option that, that this program chooses to calculate the pass rate, you just need to tell us which one it is. There's no option that's better than the other. All four of those options um, are equally uh, acceptable. So just tell us which option you've used and present the data related to that option, please. The program must provide certification pass rate data for each exam, but may combine data if there's multiple exams related to the same role and population. And we use the example as FNP uh, students have some options for taking certification exams. And lastly, pass rate data are not provided by campus sites. Um, that only applies to licensure pass rate data. If you have four campuses and they all have an FNP program, all that data can be put together for the, for the one degree, for either a master's for if it's just a master's degree for the master's degree. If there's a post-master's certificate FNP program, all the post-master's certificate data could be combined. But remember, the programs need to be treated, um, post-master's certificate and uh, master's degree program data would need to be reported separately. Okay. A 4E addresses employment rates, and the first statement there, again, if you uh, haven't graduated anybody from your program, then this key element is not applicable to you because you wouldn't expect people to be employed yet. So how, how are you going to look at your employment rates? How are you going to calculate it? So there, there are a number of bullets that tell you how to do that. So if you, you have to collect your data separately for each degree program or a postgraduate APR certificate program that is being reviewed for accreditation. 
and you have to collect this data within 12 months of program completion, not at program entry. And that's there because what we found in the past is sometimes schools would um, collect the data when they admitted students to their program and would say, well, 100% of our, of our students are employed because they're all RNs and they're enrolled in our RNs BSN program. But that's not what we're looking at. What we're looking at is at the completion of the program, uh, how, how many, what percent of your students are employed. And the standard here is that 70% or higher of the graduates of the program or the completers of the program are employed. So if a school, a school can also look at their employment rates, and if they, if they haven't reached the 70% mark, then they can look at the particular students that are making up, or, or completers that are making up that cohort, and they can exclude people that have elected not to be employed. So we're going to get into a little bit more in the next slide when we do the keep in mind slide. So keep in mind again, the employment rate must be completed for each overall degree or certificate program. You don't report it by track, but by overall program or uh, certificate. And employment data are collected within 12 months of completion, not at program entry. So that means that um, you can co collect that data on an exit survey as your students are graduating from the program. I think uh, uh, in, the, in the earlier days, uh, most of our baccalaureate students all had a job offer and lined up as they were exiting our institutions. And then the job market got a little tighter. And so schools were finding, some schools were finding that they didn't meet the 70% um, employment rate on an exit survey because their students were still out there uh, figuring out the job market, looking at options and everything. So, but you have to collect the data no later than 12 months. So if you want to collect it at three months or six months, schools can do that. But uh, 12 months is the time limit for collecting the data. And again, Again, um, we're looking at, CCNE is looking at employment. We're not necessarily looking at employment within the field of nursing. We're looking at any kind of employment. And when you're looking at your employment rates, you can elect to exclude graduates who, have, who don't want to be employed. So for example, they went straight to graduate school, or they have health issues, or they have family obligations that are preventing preventing them for, from seeking employment at the time. Um, so there's a variety of reasons that people may decide not to seek employment. Four F, four, um, okay, so here's some examples of four E. So the expected outcome is 70% of the baccalaureate degree graduates who seek employment will be employed within 12 months of graduation. And what this particular hypothetical school discovered is that 78% of their uh, graduates from their baccalaureate program were employed within 12 months of graduation. Therefore, the baccalaureate program exceeded CC's in easy expectation of 70% for employment within 12 months of graduation. So that's an example of how a school might write to this um, 4E, part of this 4E. Now 4F focuses on the use of those data that CC has prescribed an achievement rate. So okay, now you have told us in, told us your completion rates, your licensure cert pass rates, your certification pass rates, and your employment rates. And now we want to see how you're using that data for, for uh, program improvement. Again, this key element is only applicable if you have data for, for, for on completion, on licensure, certification, and employment. If there's not any data for any of these key elements, then this uh, key element for F would, uh, would not be applicable to your program. 
But if you have, for example, uh, you've graduated a, graduated a student, so you have a completer, but maybe that person hasn't set for licensure yet. And maybe you didn't prepare them for certification and they've completed the program, but maybe they, it's not been 12 months out, then, then uh, you still would have to talk about your completion rates, but you wouldn't have to talk about those other uh, other key elements because, of course, they don't apply to your particular situation. So when, in your, when you're discussing the use of the data for program improvement, you should address, if you look at the bullet points, the discrepancies between what a, your program actually found and what CCNE expectation was, and you know, note that completion rates is 70%, licensure 80, certification 80, employment is 70%. And then you are presenting what you're doing in your program based on what you found when you compared your actual, your expected to your actual. And when you're talking about what you're doing for improvement or to help your program achieve those outcomes, if, you're, if you haven't been achieving those outcomes, then of course you also are going to want to include how faculty are engaged in that process. And you want to provide some examples of that. So we will move on, Mary Jane. Okay, I'll pick it up here. So key element 4G addresses aggregate faculty outcomes that demonstrate program effectiveness. So the program demonstrates achievement of expected faculty outcomes. Um, these outcomes should be consistent with and contribute to the mission and goals and congruent with institution and program expectations. If you're having trouble uh, determining what your aggregate outcomes are, you might look back to 1D where we asked you to uh, identify the expected faculty outcome. So that might help you there. They gave some examples are given. Those outcomes could be related to teaching, scholarship, service, practice, or any other identified faculty outcome. So here in 4G, you are uh, specifically um, identifying the expected faculty outcomes. With that, you're identifying expected levels of achievement for those outcomes for faculty as a group. And then we're also going to ask you to tell us what the actual faculty outcomes are. Now note here, we are only asking for data, as Deborah talked about in the beginning, related to aggregate faculty outcomes. We are not asking for specific achievements of individual faculty members. In 4G, we're asking you to give us the expected aggregate faculty outcomes and the actual faculty outcomes. We're asking you to present those data. And the data obviously needs to be measurable. One last point there in the last paragraph that I'll make is that faculty outcomes can vary for different groups of faculty, uh, full-time, part-time, adjunct, tenured, non-tenured, or other. And these outcomes may be presented separately for each different group of faculty if you would choose to do so. There might be scholarship, might be an expectation of full-time faculty, it may not be of part-time faculty. So the outcomes can vary for different groups of faculty. But in 4G, we're asking that you give us the expected aggregate faculty outcomes and then also present us with the data of what the actual faculty, ag or the actual aggregate faculty outcomes are. We are no longer asking for individual data, only aggregate data. Some examples, 90% of faculty will engage in a professional development activity. Um, the amount of revenue generated through faculty practice maybe would increase by 3% over the prior year. The amount of grant funding for a school would increase by 10% over the prior year. 75% of nursing faculty will serve on a college or committee. Now, please note these are just examples. Um, note that each has an expected level of achievement. Uh, the outcomes obviously please need to be measurable. These examples represent teaching, scholarship, practice, and service. 
And then in 4-H, in 4-G, we ask you to share with us the actual and expected aggregate faculty outcomes. And in 4-H, we're asking you to analyze these data. Analyze the data, compare, analyze the data related to expected and actual faculty outcome, identify discrepancies between the actual and expected outcomes, and then share with us how you're using that information to improve your program, to foster ongoing program improvement. Additionally and finally here, we want, to, we want you to be able to demonstrate that faculty are engaged in the program improvement process. So in G, you're, you're giving us the actual and expected aggregate faculty outcomes, and in H, you're analyzing these data and telling us how you're using these data to improve your program. All right, key element 4I. So this key element addresses um, achievement of outcomes other than those that, that have already been described. So completion rate, licensure, pass rate, certification pass rates, employment rates, and outcomes related to faculty. And the process for addressing this key element is a lot like 4G that um, Mary Jane just talked about. And it's, it's, it's listing, listing what other program outcomes you have. And the, the expectation is, is that the program will define what their other program outcomes are, besides those that have been prescribed for them, if you will, and that they incorporate expected levels of achievement. They describe how they're going to measure those outcomes. They're going to measure and determine what the actual levels of achievement were. And then they're going to compare what they expected to what they actually achieved. And also, finally, the program outcomes should be appropriate and relevant to the degree program being offered that's being accredited. So in our next slide, we are going to see some examples of other student outcomes that, that uh, a program might use. So a program might decide that they're interested, for example, in satisfaction, determining the satisfaction of constituents with their program. So they might have an outcome that student, alumni, employer surveys will reflect a score of at least three on a four-point Likert scale, whereas we might say that five is highly agree and one is highly disagree. A school might decide that for their students, they want their students to participate in a particular program that they take pride in, their, their honors program, a study abroad program, or service learning. So a school may say that 25% or more of our baccalaureate students will participate in the honors program, or will participate in the study abroad program, or 25% will have an or more will have an opportunity to participate in service learning. Then they would see how many students actually did that and compare to see whether they met their 25%. The next example, so a school may have as, as a, a goal that, um, or a program outcome is that they really are preparing their students to go on for graduate study. And so they are going to ask their students on exit surveys and they want to find that at least 20% of their baccalaureate students will report on that exit survey that they intend to seek graduate education within five years. The last uh, bullet point, so the school may have a goal to prepare students for leadership positions. And so this school, in order to measure whether they are actually achieving that uh, outcome, they may put a question on their alumni survey and ask their alumni in the survey how many of them have served in, on leadership, have served in a leadership role within a, uh, a community group or professional, a professional organization or whatever their focus is, and the school analyzes that with the goal of having at least 40% of their graduates saying that they have served in at least one professional leadership role after they have graduated. So th those are just a few examples of how schools might structure their outcomes. 
And uh, I think that when schools look at program outcomes, they want to um, want to try to be appropriate for their for their for their um, particular student body or their school. So, for example, um, you might say that um, uh, the third bullet, where we said on the exit survey, we only wanted 20% of the baccalaureate students to report on an exit survey that they're seeking graduation within five years. If a school had uh, decided, well, instead of doing it on an exit survey, let's do it on an alumni survey that we send out at year three or four, then they may have a, a very different percent uh, response that they want back. So again, it is uh, contextual, if you will, as to how these program outcomes are going to be worded, how they're going to be measured. So we will move on to the next slide. So just like 4-H, four 4-J um, four is taking the data that was presented in the previous key element where schools or programs, programs have listed their outcomes and they've told, told how they are measuring those outcomes compared actual to expected. In this key element, you're taking that data and, you're, and you are using it Showing, showing how you're using it for program improvement. So for example, a, a program finds that on a satisfaction survey of employers that the, the uh, employers rate the program less than 3.0 that they wanted on that satisfaction survey. So in this key element, the program would take that information that they reported in the previous key element where they tell you we sent out a, a survey to our employers, we got back a 2.5, or, or we expected to get at least a three or higher. So here's how we have further delved down into that information to determine what it is that employers are not satisfied with with our graduates. And here are the kinds of things that we are doing to improve our program or maybe collect more data so that we can specifically see exactly what it is we need to improve. And um, so that's the kind of information that you're going to put in this, in this particular key element. And you're going to want to discuss again how the faculty are engaged in this program improvement process. So the next section, Mary Jane, you can okay. is your Supporting. take again. All right. I'll do the first three. So supporting documentation, this is some information you could have in your um, resource room or as part of your, uh, uh, part of your self study. Um, evidence of a systematic written comprehensive process, either evaluation plan, assessment plan, it needs to be written so we need to see what that plan is. We also need examples, explain to us, show to us, show evidence that this process is reviewed on some sort of ongoing basis minutes from meetings or supplemental documents that represent that. A summary of the aggregate student outcomes with comparison of actual levels to expected levels, the data we talked about in those various key elements related to completion rates, NCLEX RN pass rate, certification pass rate uh, for the APRN roles and for any other roles for which the program State, it prepares graduates to take a certain exam and employment rates for uh, degree or certificate programs as applicable. Deb? So as we move on, number four, you're going to want to provide a summary of the aggregate faculty outcomes for the past three years and a comparison of actual levels to aggregate levels. Of, fac of expected faculty outcomes. You're going to need to provide um, a summary of aggregate program identified outcomes for the past three years with a comparison of actual levels with expected levels. And then documents such as minutes, memorabilia, reports, anything that you have that can help the uh, site evaluators show that, uh, demonstrate that data analysis has occurred, that there's an explanation of variances between actual and expected outcomes, and that data are actually being used for ongoing program improvement. 
that, that's uh, real helpful for program evaluators to be able to give some examples in their report of what they found within your supporting documentation that further supports and uh, is exempt an example of how you are meeting that particular um, uh, key element. Thank you, Deborah. So first of all, I'd like to note that we got through the primary content of standard four in exactly the 90 minutes. So congr congratulations, Deborah and Mary Jane. I know that that was tough. Um, I just want to let our participants know, and I'm going to be flipping through the slides as I'm talking, but slides 45 through 54 are simply our glossary, and I really encourage you if there is something that you don't understand when you're going through the cc &E standards, take a minute and flip to the glossary. You might find that there's an explanation there that helps you out. As I mentioned at the top of the Last hour, the final pre-publication version of the 2018 standards is available on the CCNE website um, and for chief nurse administrators and on-site evaluators in the CCNE online community. We have a number of other resources you might find helpful, the procedures, the overview of the CCNE accreditation process, our general advice for hosting the CCNE on-site evaluation, and all the professional nursing standards and guidelines that are required by CCNE. As always, if you have questions, the CCNE staff are ready and available to answer your questions. And here's contact information for myself, Lori Schrader, and Lena Trollinger, Associate Director. We've called out ourselves in particular because of our roles within CCNE, but of course, any of the CCNE staff are always available to help. Um, I'm sure that all of all of our participants thank me for the time that Mary Jane and Deborah spent with us this afternoon going through standard four, and I'm going to turn it back to Sean. All right, thank you. This now concludes, our, concludes today's webinar. Thank you again to our speakers, and thank you to our audience for joining us this afternoon. On your screen and in the chat box, you will see a link to the evaluation form. If you'd like to complete, complete it at this time, put on the link in your chat box. If you do not have time now, a link will be emailed to our attendees. At the end of this evaluation, there will be a link for you to download for your contact hour, which you can sign and print for your records. Thank you all again, and have a wonderful day.